What's outside the universe? My friend Melody asked me this question when I was eight years old. I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy, but this time I had no idea what to say. The question was scary. I grew up in southern Utah in the western part of the United States, and this is the land of red rocks, hot, dry summer nights, and clear skies, and these are perfect conditions for stargazing. And as a kid, Melody and I would bicycle out of town to get away from the lights of the city, and we'd stare up at the night sky, and we'd ask each other questions about the cosmos. How big is the Earth? What is the sun made of? Why can't I see a black hole? How far away is that galaxy there? What's at the edge of the universe? When she asked me that, that one, I stopped and I thought about it and I said, I don't know. And Melody said, my ancestors thought that the earth was a big flat rock with a solid dome of sky above it and the stars were painted on it. And it was all held in the palm of a big creature who would occasionally shake it. And we stared up at this dome of stars, and I said, well, they didn't have telescopes back then, so I think that's a good first guess. But now that we know that the universe is huge, I, I, I don't know what's at the edge of the universe. Melody was an indigenous Native American from a local tribe. I don't remember if she was Paiute or Navajo, and the other kids in school would often make fun of Melody and calling her nasty names. She didn't like tests, she didn't like homework assignments, but she ran circles around the other kids in classroom discussions with the teacher, and there was a reason why she and I were good friends, because she was never afraid to ask the big questions. And when she finally asked me, what's outside the universe? The question caught me off guard. Finally, I said, well, nothing. The universe is everything, and it doesn't make any sense to ask what's outside everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, but if the universe has an edge, there has to be something beyond the edge, she reasoned. We sat there for silently for a long time, and finally I said, maybe there is no edge and no outside. And Melody said, yeah, maybe the universe just goes on forever and ever and that's all there is. And after another long pause, I finally turned to Melody and I said, everything is terrifying. And as you can see, I was a very serious child. <laughs> um, maybe not so completely serious, because for me, terrifying doesn't have to be a bad thing. But before we go too far, we need to define, we need to answer one really important question. What is the universe? Picture the last time you were out in the wilderness and you looked up at the night sky. Thousands of pinpoints of light, photons from stars and galaxies, thousands of light years away, a light year being the distance that light travels in one year, to finally hit the earth and smack into the back of your eye eyeballs. When you look up at the night sky, you're looking backward in time. But look closer. In between two of those points of light, what do you see? It looks like empty space, but it's not. Your eyes are quite good photon detectors for one particular range of photon wavelengths, but on cosmic scales, your eyes are terrible experimental apparatuses because they can only see a relatively narrow range of possible photon wavelengths, and there's way more that's hitting our Earth all the time that you can't see with your eyes. If you were to use humanity's best photon detectors, like satellite telescopes, you'd see hidden light. Photons from stars and galaxies, millions and billions of light years away, and eventually, you would see something absolutely remarkable. The cosmic microwave background radiation. Light from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. This is the closest we can get to a baby picture of our universe. But wait a minute. Baby picture, a few hundred thousand years old, that's a pretty old baby. 
Where's the light from before then? That light hasn't had time to reach us yet, and most of it never will. The universe is expanding. All of those galaxies that you see with your eyes, they're all moving away from each other in all directions. The universe is expanding. But expanding into what to address our question of what's outside the universe? Expanding into nothing. Space itself is expanding. The background metric spatial grid upon which everything rests and is defined is being stretched. Two galaxies in our universe are like two pins stuck into a rubber sheet that is being pulled in all directions. From the perspective of an ant on the sheet, nothing happened to make the pins move apart. The fabric of space itself, the sheet, is being stretched, and the pins, the distance between the pins is increasing. So if everything is moving apart from everything else in the universe, we can simply run the clock backwards. And at some point long ago, billions of years ago, everything in the universe had to have been packed into a tiny, dense little point that then started expanding. And this, as you know, is known as the Big Bang. But it's not just the fact that the universe is expanding and has been for billions of years. It's the particular way that it did so throughout its history. There's so much that we can't explain if the universe expanded at a constant rate its entire history. Why do we see big things in the sky at all, like galaxies or cosmic structures? Why does the stuff in that part of the sky more or less look like all the stuff in that part of the sky? Why does that cosmic microwave background radiation, this baby picture of the universe, why is it essentially uniform in temperature? Don't let the color coding fool you. My astronomer friends did that to highlight the tiny differences, but it's basically uniform in all directions. None of this stuff makes any sense unless, right at the moment of the universe's birth, it didn't just expand at a constant rate, but instead immediately insanely inflated and that before tapering off to a much more gradual rate. And this inflation was not some minor thing. <laughs> Imagine if we took a horse and magically inflated it to the size of the observable universe now in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That's what inflation was like at the moment of the Big Bang. This inflation and expansion of space happened so fast, much faster than the speed of light. And as you know, the speed of light is the top possible speed with which anything can be sent. A spaceship, you, a light signal, any kind of signal. And as a result, this expansion was so much faster than the speed of light that most of the stuff in the universe was instantly separated from us forever. This leads us to a new concept, the observable universe. Our observable universe must be a tiny subset volume of the entire universe within which there must be a large number of other uni observable universes for other observers and we'll never be able to contact them ever. And it gets worse. If you look closely at the mathematics behind that insane inflation of the fabric of space, it should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. It tapered off and has been going at a much more gradual rate for billions of years. This leads us to conclude that our universe and the fabric of space upon which it sits can be thought of as two distinct things. Because in our universe, it tapered off, but the, the inflation of space goes on infinitely forever our universe is a small pocket that was popped into existence by the insane inflation of the fabric of space. And with infinity, if something happens once, it happens again and again and again. There must be an almost infinite number of other universes just like ours. In most of these universes, inflation probably never stopped and they're just dull, empty voids, and there's nothing going on, and nothing's happening. But with infinity, there must be other universes like ours. In one of them, one of you wore different shoes here today. In another one, coffee is pink. 
In another one, an Earth-like planet was obliterated by an asteroid just as protozoans started to evolve. If our understanding of inflation is correct, then this is not just idle speculation, but it's required by the concept of infinity. But, of course, some of the looks on your faces indicate that you have a very, very valid question in your, in your uh, minds. Huh? <laughs> because you're totally right. This is all speculation at the moment, right? You should be yelling at me, come on, man, you're a physicist. You need evidence. Where's the, you know, where's the test? Show me a test to be able to, why, why should we take you seriously? Part of the reason is that this is not the only piece of circumstantial evidence that we have. Our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers. These are constants of nature that we measure, but we have no particular explanation for why the values are the way they are. And if the values were slightly different, our universe would be a very different place. For example, in 2012, my colleagues and I at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, we announced the discovery of something called the Higgs boson particle, and this is a very, very weird and important particle. A reminder, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, 100 meters underground. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets colder than outer space to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And then we slam them into each other millions of times per second, briefly recreating the conditions of the universe as they were just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And then we collect a record of the debris of these collisions and then analyze it later, one of the largest data sets in human history, analyze it to look for evidence of undiscovered particles that could be answers to the biggest open questions of science. And in 2012, when we announced the discovery of this Higgs boson, there was champagne and celebration, and uh, for the prediction of the particle back in the 60s, two white males won the Nobel Prize, what else is new? And it was fantastic, a wonderful, wonderful collision, but, or it was a wonderful discovery, but there was a problem, too. There was a lot of head-scratching that went on because we probably should not have found this particle at all. The largeness of experiments, like the Large Hadron Collider, is important because larger machines allow us to get to higher collision energies. And thanks to Einstein's famous equivalence between energy and mass, E equals mc squared, if nature has a particle with a mass m, and we've only ever built a collider that gets an energy that's up to e, e here, we'll never discover it. So this is important because for the Higgs boson, there is nothing in our theory to prevent it from being something gigantically huge, way outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider. Nothing prevents that from happening. And in particle physics, if something is not prevented, it probably is supposed to happen. It will, probably will happen. But we found it down here. That's weird. That makes no sense. Why would the Higgs boson be sitting right here? One way to explain this that would be very, very, very nice is if there were a few extra particles that we would find just around the same place as the Higgs boson. And this would do something that was called regulate the Higgs mass. You don't need to know the details. But if that were true, that would be a fantastic explanation. Because the Higgs boson, let's be clear, is very, very important. The Higgs boson is proof positive that something called the Higgs field exists. And the Higgs field is more or less invisible jelly that permeates all of space all the time. And it's the thing that allows fundamental particles to have masses at all. If I'm a particle and I'm zipping through this jelly, I'm dragged a little bit, and a little bit of my energy is stuck into a point that we measure as mass. So it's really good that the Higgs field exists because without it, the electron would have a zero mass. And if the electron had a zero mass, atoms would never have formed in the universe and you would not be here right now. So it's good that the Higgs boson exists. It's good that the Higgs field exists. But what's keeping the Higgs mass down here? If there's no extra particles, and in fact, we haven't found these at the Large Hadron Collider. This is totally bizarre. And it starts to make us think that our universe is really, really strange. Did we just get lucky? Perhaps we did. But perhaps it's just a very particular type of luck. 
Recall that nature loves statistical distributions. I am not sure you will hear a nerdier statement said all day today. If you do, tell me, and I will fight that person. Um, nature loves statistical distributions. The average resting heart rate of males will be distributed as some kind of Gaussian distribution. If you stand on a street, street corner, the rate at which cars will pass you will follow a Poisson distribution. In a sense, mathematics and physics transcend our universe. So what if our Higgs mass was only one taken out of a probability distribution governing a multiverse? In our universe, the Higgs mass was chosen just right so that we have atoms that form big structures and the you could actually come here today for this conference. In all of the other ones, the Higgs mass was something else and structures never formed and they're completely dull, lifeless voids. The lack of extra particles at the Large Hadron Collider is not proof positive that, the Higgs, that, the, that we live in a multiverse, but it's another piece of evidence that leads us to try to take this concept more seriously, the concept of a multiverse. But again, you should totally be yelling at me still. That's not proof, man. Come on. Where's the evidence? You've got to have some way to test it, and you're right. And we do have a few ideas as to how to test the concept of the multiverse, but the problem is that <clears throat> they're extremely difficult to do at the moment. One way is you can look for a bruise on the universe. Remember those almost infinite number of other universes that were snapped into existence by the insane, absurd inflation of the fabric of space? What if two of them expanded right next to each other and bumped into each other? Could that be what is causing this tiny, almost imperceptible little blue cold spot in the cosmic microwave background radiation. It still remains to be seen if that conclusion fits the data better than some other conclusion, but studies are ongoing. Another way you could do this is if you try to, if you, if you try to uh, find brand new revolutionary fundamental particles that will help at, at, at gigantic colliders, AKA my day job. So, I'm a particle physicist at CERN, of course, and just a few uh, months ago, we at CERN announced our plans for the next generation of collider experiment that will be 100 kilometers around and reach energy seven times what we can do right now, and will open up completely uncharted scientific territory. If we were to find evidence of, of, of these particles at the FCC, this would be fantastic. It would help still explain why the Higgs boson is the way it is. It's okay if the particles are just a little bit outside of the LHC. That would still be fine. But if we didn't find them at this gigantic new souped-up collider in this few decades time frame, will that satisfy me? Will I then be convinced that we live in a multiverse? No. If we really wanted to find, uh, d definitively answer the question, we got to go larger and larger. So what if we built a particle collider around the circumference of the moon? This would get us to tens of thousands of times the energy of the Large Hadron Collider. And I don't have time to go through all of the innovations that I would need someone here in this room to make possible to actually do this within any reasonable time frame. I don't have time, but catch me afterwards and we'll talk about it. Basically, what I'm saying is there's a lot of innovation po potential here to make something like a moon collider happen. But would that satisfy me? If we built a moon collider and we didn't find any new particles, would I then be convinced that we live in a multiverse? No. To really do it right, we have to go very, 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 very big. We'd have to reach something called the Planck scale. And the Planck scale is such a gigantically high energy range that beyond which physics doesn't currently make any sense. If we were able to reach the Planck scale, we would be able to know everything about physics, about dark matter, about dark energy, quantum black holes, uh, the nature of time, why, why the universe is expanding the way it does, what's going to eventually happen at the very, very far end of our universe's uh, 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 you know, old age. But to reach the Planck scale by some extremely naive estimates, we would probably have to build a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. So catch me after. Well, luckily, we're at the next web, which is like Woodstock for innovators. So catch me afterwards, and uh, we, can, we can brainstorm some ways to make this happen. Um, but <laughs> so this is, the, this is more or less the ultimate Hadron Collider. But even if we were to build the ultimate Hadron Collider, and we will, 
What would we do with the answers that we get from it? Even if we were to have overwhelming circumstantial evidence that we live in a multiverse, there's probably still no way for us to ever exchange information with another universe. Such a concept currently makes no sense. So, are such questions meaningless? You may say yes, and in fact, some scientists would agree with you. And in fact, some scientists even attack our desire and intention to learn more about these questions with new machines like this FCC at CERN. It seems strange to ask this about adults, but why do some people seem, seem afraid of asking questions like this? Why do some people object to asking these questions? Could it be that they're actually afraid of the answer? And is this the same fear that caused certain people in the past to object to similar questions like, is the Earth really at the center of the solar system? And are the stars painted on a solid dome a few kilometers above our heads? The fear that you and I are not as special as we think we are. Perhaps more accurately, the fear that what you and I know right now is not all there is to know. Does this same fear affect you? What might happen if you quit your safe day job and instead work on that gigantic thing you've been thinking about for years, like starting a humanitarian organization, or solving poverty, or finding out a way to help uh, go, you know, to prevent governments from secretly surveilling their citizens. What might happen if you joined the new, uh, some of the new technology innovation that we're, uh, we're examining right now, some research and development, to completely revolutionize particle physics? All of the stuff I talked about, this absurd concept of a moon collider or a solar system collider, all of that is based upon our existing collider technology, our accelerator technology, which is decades old. Maybe there's a way to accelerate particles to higher energies in smaller distances. And in fact, there's something very promising that a bunch of my colleagues are working on called plasma wake fields. If this is, if this is in principle possible to completely revolutionize particle physics. Is, if, what, what, what would happen if you stopped doing what you're doing and instead worked with some of the most brilliant minds in the world to try to revolutionize our ability to understand the basic rules of nature? More, more quotidian, what might happen if you stopped working on a long string of smartphone apps and instead worked on some gigantic problem, some huge problem that you've been thinking about for years but never really got around to doing? The answer to all of these questions is quite possibly nothing. But you currently don't know that. And you never will unless you take the big leap and find out. Always ask the big questions. To me, to me the safety of ignorance will never compete with the scary beauty and terrifying joy of knowledge, always ask the big questions. Always allow yourself the bravery of stepping outside of the known and always embrace trying to find new knowledge to vanquish the fear because you know what? This fear, this fear distracts us from some of the basic objective truths of physical reality. We don't have to be scared of the concept of a multiverse because at the end of the day, we know one thing for sure. There is at least one universe. And you and I, all of us, humanity, when we ask questions about the universe, we, humanity, are the method by which the universe asks questions about itself. And when I see the US government put children in cages on the Mexico-US border, and when I see that one of the largest uh, parties, political parties in the Dutch Senate is founded on explicitly racist white nationalist and climate denial policies, and when I see that decades of unfettered global capitalism are rendering the earth uninhabitable due to climate, climate change and we're not doing anything about it, and when I think about my friend Melody and how the other kids would make fun of her and how that made it difficult for her to go to class, and how she never went to high school. I feel anger. It's not just regular anger, I feel that too, because you know, we lost a great scientist, but 
I also feel a kind of anger that only comes from being a physicist, because I realize that when we allow these things to happen, we're betraying a cosmic truth, that we are all in the same universe, and we're all in this universe together. And so back on that red rock in Utah, I turned to Melody and I said, everything is terrifying. And she was silent for a long time, and finally she said, yeah, but it would be scarier if I were out here by myself. And I stared at her for a while, and I said, yeah. And we both looked up at this dome of sky, the stars and the galaxies watching us from very far away. Thanks. Thank you.